Hey guys and girls, uh, just waiting for everyone to hop online. I can see there's a few more people hopping online now. Uh, just wait a couple of minutes, a couple of seconds before everyone gets in. And uh, yeah, just want to make sure first and foremost, can everyone hear me? If you could just write a little message to say that you can hear me and all that, beautiful. I can see some messages coming through, awesome stuff. Cool, cool. Just waiting for, I can see there's a large amount of people coming in now. So, uh, yeah, let's get the show on the road. So uh, thanks a lot for joining in tonight and uh, obviously congratulations on, you know, opening up your mind to what's happening out there in the marketplace and seeing what uh, what is in store for the financial markets or what I see in store for the financial markets. And today I'll be giving you a little bit more in depth. I don't know if many of you came on last week's uh, webinar, but if you didn't have a chance to see uh, last week's webinar, I think it's very, very important if you want to email my office and maybe they could be kind enough to send you a copy of last week's webinar uh, because they sort of interwine uh, with each other, um, you know, each, each other uh, in the series. So just uh, before we get started, first and foremost, uh, housekeeping rules is I'm not a financial advisor. I'm not your financial advisor. Uh, it's always important to go and seek independent financial advice, legal advice, and investment advice. If you, uh, yeah, everything I'm saying today is just my views, my opinions, and what I see happening out there in the marketplace. So just a little bit of recap as of last week's uh, webinar that uh, we had. Um, covering off last week, I was talking a little bit about what's happening in the property market, what's happening in the financial markets, and it was probably, it went on a little bit too long. <laughs> it was about a one and a half hour webinar and tonight, I'm hoping to keep that a lot, a lot shorter. Uh, but I went through a lot of charts and actually explaining how money is created, where money comes from, uh, talking about what I'm feeling is happening in the marketplace at the moment, which is a liquidity crisis. Uh, going back in 2008, uh, we saw the GFC. Uh, to get out of the GFC, what happened is we printed a lot of uh, money for stimulus, uh, which uh, ended up causing a lot of the uh, increases in prices of everything we've seen of recent times, one in particular, which is property. Uh, for me, a lot of people ask, Nathan, you know, you've bought hundreds of properties. How do you, uh, you know, how do you know how to buy these properties? How do you know, you know, what to do throughout all these different markets? And, you know, from my side, I retired from the workforce uh, at the age of 24 in the middle of the GFC. And, you know, I've used financial instruments, all different financial instruments over the years. I'm currently using and adapting some new strategies, uh, which I'm, I'm not really, you know, I normally try stuff on myself first and if I blow off my arms and it's only my arms that have got blown off and no one else's. So uh, over the course of the next 12 months, I will be sharing some more of that stuff uh, with you guys as to, you know, how, I'm, you know, growing my property portfolio and pushing it through different market cycles. So. Um, what I'm seeing is a potential GFC 2.0, which is coined the GFD, which is basically a liquidity crisis. Uh, back in 2008, uh, we saw $7.5 trillion worth of derivatives uh, based on the housing market, which caused the GFC. And today, in 2018, we have some large financial institutions out in the world, which have $75 trillion just in the one sort of institution worth of derivatives. So uh, and they're not tied to property, they're tied to everything. Everything's been inflated and all the fundamentals are off the table due to the level of manipulation out in the financial system. And you know, we're going into a very uncharted territory uh, and which is what I covered off in the last uh, episode. And I think there was about a thousand people that had registered for that. Uh, I covered off how you know the GFD would sort of come to us. I uh, didn't go into details as to what would happen and that's what you guys are obviously watching tonight. Um, I covered off on to where the monetary system came from, talked about history of money. Uh, I've been collecting different types of money uh, since I was 13 years old, always questioning who makes the money, how the money get made, etc, etc. And I went into a very detailed analysis on that front and also talked about how people can educate themselves to protect themselves through uh, you know, the potential crisis that's coming up. And tonight, uh, as agenda, I want to talk about how to armor yourself uh, with knowledge to get through the, uh, the GFD. Obviously, what will happen during the crash, uh, what will happen after the crash, 
how to protect yourself through that. Uh, what does it mean for property? Will property prices go up, down, sideways, whatever? And how to capitalize on the opportunities that are out there. So just having a look here, there's a lot of uh, questions coming through. I'll try and get some of your questions a little bit later. So feel free to pop some questions down. If not, I will uh, make some side videos with uh, some of the topics that you've got as questions. So how to armor yourself with knowledge. I can see a question there from Kenan uh, asking, you know, where, where to get your knowledge from. It's quite timely. Um, where do you get me information from? Be very careful out there. Uh, you know, in this marketplace, a lot of people get their knowledge from, uh, you know, the TV or the TV programming and they get indoctrinated via, you know, they get their relationship advice nowadays from the same place, from married at first sight. Um, you know, they get their financial advice from those same places as well. Uh, you know, it's, uh, I remember when I was a kid, there was some uh, TV shows like Agri's Card and Connection and Cheese TV, which showed me cartoons and the bike and mice from Mars. However, nowadays, most people get those financial advice from the so-called experts in that sort of time slot. So be very, very careful on where you get your advice from, uh, because it can be very, uh, you know, misguided, should I say. Um, what, uh, what, what I like to look at is the fundamentals. If we go back through any of the property uh, booms, busts, and throughout history of the last, you know, 30, 40 years, the current financial system, the current monetary system that we're using has only been in existence since 1971. And uh, it's a fiat currency, fiat currencies, which is sort of what I covered off last time, fiat currencies, the first one was in 1024 uh, BC, um, which is, uh, AD, sorry, uh, which was in China. So the first hyperinflation which occurred was in China about 1,000 years ago, and there's literally been 10,000 uh, fiat currencies since that that have all eventuated in the hyperinflation. They usually only last about 42 to 45 years in time, and we're sort of at that period at the moment. And I see that out of what we're with the manipulation that we've got in the financial sector, uh, I strongly feel that we could see a, uh, a hyperinflation uh, sometime in the course of the next few years, coming through to the next decade. So. Uh, that, you know, understanding how money works gives you an opportunity to understand how everything on top of that uh, chessboard uh, operates and manoeuvres and, you know, the sort of vehicles that you can take through sort of marketplaces. So uh, for me, I would rather be sort of buying properties during a, uh, a softer period in time. Uh, it means that you can get stuff that's on sale and, and things like that. Um, basically, the, the, the fundamentals, most people will get scared. I don't know if anyone in here has ever invested in like sort of cryptocurrency or whatever. If you look at that compared to the share market or the stock market, most people see a drop of 5% or 10%. They'll go and run and sell their stuff. Uh, you know, different markets are new and emerging. People will actually think it's a good opportunity to pick up at the bottom. And, you know, that's where, you know, for me, I was building my portfolio. I started my portfolio in a very flat and ugly market going back in 2003 in Sydney. And, uh, you know, if I didn't do the hard work back in those days, I wouldn't be in a position of where I am today. And it all comes down to, you know, understanding how, you know, these every part of the uh, financial system goes into play to make the fundamentals of property go up. So looking at, um, yeah, the media at the moment, I, I touched on it beforehand. A lot of the commentators in the media, um, you know, simply don't know you know, shit really. Uh, they're talking about statistical data. They're talking about hypothetical data. Um, they're talking about, you know, their own vested interest. Uh, everyone always says to me, and has said over the years, Nathan, you, you just talk up property because it's it's good for you to talk about what pushes the prices up. I'll talk about property because of the actual factual fundamentals that underlay that. And, you know, I'm saying today that property is still good and I'm still buying property and I'm still investing in the property. However, I'm talking about the factuals of where the market is currently at. And based on the monetary supply and the monetary system out there in the, in the, in the finance markets at the moment, there is a thing called a liquidity crisis. Once again, referring back to the, the first video of uh, this webinar series, but we've got a, a liquidity crisis which is happening at the moment, which is causing uh, you know, finance to be very, very difficult to obtain. Um, over the course of the last, uh, 24 months or 18 months since September 2016, we've seen um, a liquidity 
uh, event happen in the financial markets globally, which is sort of winding back what um, what stimulus and quantitative easing had happened globally throughout the GFC. And what that is doing is making it harder for people to get at finance and retain finance and, and whatnot. And you know, from all the financial uh, you know resources that are in the marketplace, the news, uh, whether it be your brokers, whether it be whatever, there's a lot of people that aren't talking about the stuff because they have a vested interest in you know selling your product, selling your service, uh, and so on and so forth. However, you know what the what what is key is understanding what's happening out in the real marketplace and generally like. Yeah, you know, from my side of things, like I've been a part of like ten thousand real estate transactions over the last fifteen years for myself and for other people that I've taken part of. And looking at that, you know, I've got exposure to a large litmus paper in the in the marketplace. And what I'm seeing out there at the moment, I, I normally tell my agents like, you know, how things are going. They ask me, I ask them how things are going, and then I tell them what I'm seeing out there, the, the greater market. Uh, basically, um, what uh, what I'm seeing out there at the moment is very different to being what's being reported and there's some steps that you can take in order to protect yourself um, and, and take advantage of the situation. So one of the things that I'm seeing is statistical data, you know, buyers have dipped off a little bit, house clearance rates, so on and so forth. What is the biggest thing is that speaking to agents on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis, I saw going back about Eight months ago, investors started to disappear out of the marketplace from buyer inquiry with inside real estate agency, real estate agents' offices. And you know, when you're taking out a certain segment out of the marketplace, you're you know leaving less people and uh, more properties there for sale. It's obviously going to have some sort of impact. And you know, what I'm seeing at the moment is um, you know agents telling me that things are tough and all that sort of stuff out there, but yeah, it's, it's great because I'd rather be dealing with those agents like that now and, and people might say, well, you know, you're just looking for opportunity and being like a hawk, like I've been doing this for 15 years. And, you know, in times when things are a little bit more soft, you, you know, you load up your ambulance and you go around chasing and looking for accidents and, and try and capitalise on the situation. And, you know, in, in the market, the statistical data is showing stuff from three to six months ago. But being actually in the market, I'm seeing stuff that's happening today and how that's going to roll out over the next three to six months to 12 months. So <clears throat> I don't think that there's, uh, you know, I don't think there's many people out there that are reporting on the actual factuals that's in the marketplace. And from my side, you know, sharing the knowledge, there's nothing in it for me to do if property's doing great or doing bad or whatever. I know that I go home, I know that I've got my own assets that I invest in myself and uh, you know I know what they're doing. So I'm just sharing this knowledge with you just for the you know the, the reason of doing so. Um, I think it's important to, as I said before, and to really understand and do a lot of research into how you know the, the fundamentals uh, work under any sort of marketplace and monetary policy is the biggest fundamental that plays in our whole financial system. Uh, I don't invest into shares. I have done at certain periods of time. I don't at the moment. I think they're very, very risky. That's my personal opinion. As I said, it's not financial advice. But I do look at those markets because they do have telltale signs. Uh, you know, the, the, the whole financial system is very sick from a liquidity side of things. And, you know, being able to understand and read those sort of markets, you can sort of draw conclusions as to where certain events may or may not take place. Uh, I think it's important to have you know, the right team of people around you. Uh, I went out to um, a, a pub the other week. I was having a meeting with someone and some drunk guy came up to me uh, in a suit and started talking about uh, just random stuff. And he, I found out he was a financial advisor, asked him some questions. And I thought to myself, if this guy's giving advice, you know, he's going to hurt a lot of people if things don't go as, you know, as they, as they have been going for the course of the last um eight or nine years with uh, monetary, with quantitative easing out there in the monetary system. So on that front, what will happen during uh, an economy slowdown or what I'd call the GFD? I actually think we're probably partially the way into it. I think we're about one third of the way through uh, this cycle. I think that if we do see uh, the GFD, which is the 
I've coined it as the um, global financial depression. Uh, the GFC was a global financial crisis. Uh, I think that it could shadow what uh, what we saw back in 2008. I think that it will be very short-lived in comparison to other major events like this in the past uh, due to the fact that we're going to have a lot of stimulus come in the market. Stimulus is good and that's what's obviously made uh, property prices go up favourably in the last uh, decade. So uh, as I said, I'll keep referring back to it. In the previous uh, webinar that I had, I talked about how interest rates have gone up, how all the financial markets work together. I think it's important to tie that into this one and, and see it. But you know, as the phases uh, of the crash will happen, the biggest thing that I see uh, imploding out there, the biggest risk in the financial market at the moment for myself that I see is um, the derivatives market. The derivatives market is a time bomb. There's nothing like it. It's just, if you've seen the big short, it's cat shit wrapped in dog shit, wrapped in whatever. Um, and from that perspective, what is gonna be the detonator for that? What is gonna be triggering off uh, the derivative market to implode. It could be a, a number of different things. It could be mark to market on the stock exchange uh, or in the stock market in the US and the Dow Jones. Uh, it could be you know, a big significant event. All the things that would normally uh, not be on the table that we haven't seen for the last 10 years. A lot of people forget what happened in the past. Um, I will be talking a bit about property markets in 2000 and uh, you know, three to 2008, 2010, so on and so forth, a little bit later on tonight. But a lot of people forget certain phases that we've been through. It was only the other day, like yesterday, I think it was, where uh, we were advised by our propaganda outlets, the, the media, that um, that we've only got like 21 days worth of oil. And I quizzed some people recently when we were shut down for four hours in the day. And it was a big outrage. What would happen if the boats didn't come with food for a few days? And if we go back to 2008, uh, you may recall that um, we actually saw oil prices go up and petrol prices go up and all that sort of stuff just before it, and it's because of contracts that don't work in the back end, uh, contracts that are uh, you know futures and derivatives that are on oil that can't be filled and so on and so forth. So what I'm seeing out there at the moment is the, the telltale signs of that. I think that it would be the stock market, the derivative market and the bond market that would be uh, hitting. Uh, there could be a death cross where the uh, 30, uh, with the three month global rate could hit the 10 year US Treasury bond rate and that could actually cause a lot of liquidity to be sucked out of the market quickly. And if that was to occur, um, we would see an event which would trigger off and be a detonator for those derivatives and, and, and the stock market obviously. Um, looking at what, um, what is starting to happen. As I said, uh, liquidity is disappearing out of the market, but I think we're going to see a lot more liquidity disappear out of the marketplace. I think we will see uh, a lot less people out there buying in the marketplace, in the property market. I think we'll start to see building slow down. We've seen probably one of the largest building and construction booms. And now this is an all bad stuff, but I'm just trying to get you up to speed as to you know what's happening out in the marketplace because the, I feel that there's a lot of misinformation. A lot of people aren't prepared. They're just happy and they're thinking about what's happening out there. And you know, if you aren't prepared and you think everything's going to be rosy and you're not expecting a car accident and you don't insure your car, if you do have an accident, like are you going to be covered for it and so on and so forth. So looking out there, being prepared is is, is very important. Uh, always talk about being aggressive in certain aspects, but always talk about being conservative at the same time to sort of mitigate any sort of potential risks. So yeah, looking at um, the stock market, I see that being a potential time bomb in there. But um, looking at the property market, I see that we're at a point where stock is starting to stay on the market for a lot longer. Uh, prices to sell your property or to shift your property, uh, you're going to be, you know, having to lower your price. Uh, and I think once, you know, there's a few people out there in a the financial struggle, this property ain't selling or that property ain't selling, something starts happening with their financial position, what we could quite well see is a lot of people start reducing their prices, which could bring prices down a little bit. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, idiots that have been out in the marketplace for decades 
um, you know, without mentioning any of their names, but you know, the, you can probably look at them uh, when they pop their heads up every now and then. What uh, they've been coming out the market for the last you know couple of decades, saying house prices are going to drop by forty percent and it's all going to end in Armageddon and stuff like that. Yeah, you know, I don't see that happening. Just purely based on the fundamentals of the monetary system, the money will die, not the the markets. The markets are going to be propped up from every aspect, from every single market. Uh, in the past, we've seen you know different sort of recessionary cycles, which have been caused mainly around one group of sort of investment class. However, due to the amount of stimulus and quantitative easing that occurred over the period of uh, you know the last decade, everything's sort of been inflated, and it, it's it's a much more serious sort of um, you know, concoction to work with than, than what we have done in the past. So I I think that, um, you know, looking at the market, stock will stay on the market for, for longer. Uh, certainly seeing a lot of agents calling me uh, going back two, three, four years ago on the Sydney property market. You know, agents forget who you are. They uh, lose their, um, they get a bit greedy. Uh, there's certainly a lot of real estate agents that I'm dealing with. I've dealt with literally thousands of real estate agents <clears throat> over the years and you know some of my very good real estate agents from when things were a little bit tough for them out there uh you know got a bit excited and weren't looking after me through a time which i wanted them to by giving me cheap properties and all that they were just looking after themselves and uh, i asked them to kindly to delete my number and to never do business with me again doesn't matter what they've got because i don't do business like that but I'm starting to see, you know, a lot of those people trying to claw their way through. Uh, it was only today that we had one of those sort of agents trying to get to our office and send them a nice email saying, you know, delete our numbers, don't want to hear about what you've got to talk about. Um, but seeing those little sort of telltale signs, like the agents are starting to, you know, have to work a lot harder than what they did in order to sell a property. Um, things to watch out for, uh, owners will get desperate. That's a good opportunity out there to pick up properties that are you know, below market value. If you remember my three keys to investing, below market value, upside for growth, strong cash flow, they'll survive through any sort of marketplace. Looking at the below market value aspect, if you can pick up something on sale, I'd rather buy it on sale than you know, at a full price. Uh, there's lots more opportunities in the negotiation front of things. Um, looking at bank repos, I haven't seen any of this yet. And I think given the fact that we're on cheap credit, uh, everyone is, especially it's not just an Australian problem. So a lot of people look at <coughs> property markets um, in Australia and say, oh, you know, should I buy a three bedroom house on this street or that street or that suburb or whatever. People always ask me, the number one thing people ask me is where is the best place to buy? And there's literally been, you know, hundreds of markets that have bought in over the years there's different sort of inner markets and outer markets there's different fundamentals that are you know causing certain markets to do certain things uh, for example at the moment given that uh, you know there's a bit of a liquidity issue especially around investors because they're trying to minimize the risks the banks have you know been regulated by the bodies i wouldn't even call them the government i call them the industry bodies which are you know basically the bigger parts of the banks which are conforming um, yeah, the banks to minimise their risk from lending to investors and whatnot. I'm finding that in a few of those investor-centric areas where there's not much owner-occupier and very heavily dense uh, investor pockets, that prices are being hit and are being softened where I think they should be seeing a boom now because I haven't seen it for a, a very long time sort of thing. So, you know, the opportunities are out there, um, bank repos, will most likely come in to effect, but they're not out there at the moment. Uh, I have spoken to some of my industry contacts, which do run, uh, you know, they're called a, what do they call them? They call them a, um, they're like a disposal service. So the bank comes in, they appoint a trustee to take care of disposing of them. Um, and then they go out to the real estate agents and appoint real estate agents, clean them up, get rid of all the dump cars and furniture that was left behind. And um, I know a few of those places which have, you know, gone from like 10 staff up to like 80, 90, just getting prepared for this sort of stuff. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a good time out there to be buying. Uh, you're starting to see incentives out there from uh, sellers, uh, whether it be buy a new home or buy a new unit. And you get your stamp duty paid for, you get some free furniture, you get your first two years worth of strata bills paid, so on and so forth. And, um, you know, I think these incentives will get stronger and stronger. 
as things get tighter and tighter out in the marketplace. Um, it'll become harder to obtain finance. I've got a webinar, I've got a few more webinars in this series where I'll be talking more specifically about finance and being able to um, navigate through those finance markets because there's some very, very, very important things to protect yourself on a financing front uh, to get you know through the GFD. Um, the fundamentals are off the table, uh, given that the uh, you know the level of manipulation out there. Uh, I think that you know throughout this time, people will be thinking, let's run for the door. But if the door's on fire, you should probably be hanging more you know closer to the floor, hiding to the back corner, so there's more air circulating around there, rather than where the door's on fire. Um, I think that we'll see a lot of uh, idiots that have been out in the market. You know, everyone's become a property expert. Everyone's become a mortgage broker. Everyone's become, you know, so sophisticated in the marketplace. But three years ago, they were laying turf for a living or a labourer or whatever. And there's nothing wrong with that. But, you know, they're suddenly an expert, but haven't looked at every aspect of the marketplace. And if, you know, <clears throat> so I've got a bit of a cold at the moment as well. Um, if you can, you know, Understand how the market works. You can be ahead of these cycles and ahead of the curves, and be able to, you know, put your uh, put yourself in a safe position, but also in a position to be able to pounce on opportunities. Because I don't think that they'll be staying around for very long. Um, if we look at what sort of incentives came out during um, the GFC, when the property market looked like it was at a risk when the uh, recession was very, very much on our tail, when uh, liquidity became very tough and no one was lending to each other because they didn't know which bank was going to implode. We saw Lehman Brothers, Bear Stearns, Freddie Mac, Freddie May, all those guys um, sort of in trouble at the time. We're going to see some other banks, which are very, very large institutional banks, which are already making headlines around the world, whether it be Deutsche Bank, whether it be you know, a few other ones that are out there, um, which are very, very, they're called toxic. I'm not making this up. Go and look at, you know, Google and research Deutsche Bank derivatives uh, and find out how much they've got in their books. Once these banks start imploding, they're going to be, you know, being very careful with their, their liquidity and where they put it. Um, and in that moment, what has to happen is, uh, you know, stimulus to try and spur the market on. If we look back, in times gone by, we saw Kevin Rudd with his helicopter money, uh, throwing 900 bucks to everyone. We saw interest rates drop from 7.25% at the RBA to 3% within a period of five months. It came down by 100 basis points, 25 basis points, 100 basis points, 100 basis points, 100 basis points, so five consecutive months. Uh, besides that, we saw first home grants, which uh, Howard introduced in the early 2000s. They had um, they had gone. I think they actually removed the first home grant at the time of the GEC, but it was seven grand before that. It went out at fourteen thousand to try and spur along the housing market because when people buy properties, they need to furnish them and all that sort of stuff. And that was the opportunity there. And if I hadn't been doing everything that I could when everyone told me that the sky was falling in, I wouldn't have been in a position to retire when the GEC came. Um, and these stimulus packages that could happen moving forward, uh, once we do get to this, this part of the market, um, I think they'll have to be much, much greater than what we've seen in the past to obviously she, you know, stimulate the economy from where it will, will be sitting. So just a few things to watch out for. What will happen after the crash? I think that stimulus will come. I think that stimulus this time might include universal basic income. I think that, uh, which is basically a greater level of communism, um, the universal basic income has been mentioned of, of recent times, which is just printing money and giving to people for no reason. Uh, I think that we'll see a lot of <coughs> infrastructure projects, uh, the infrastructure projects that we'll see out there. Um, I've seen a few news articles of that of recent times as well. Um, the infrastructure projects could be new bridges, new roads, new schools, um, new airports, new train lines, so on and so forth. If we look at the booms that have gone in past times, uh, we've got, you know, the uh, the resource boom, which coming out of the GFC 
sort of ended uh, because uh, commodities were being, you know, manipulated and held artificially low. Uh, go and research a little bit into that. Uh, we saw uh, it un become sort of unprofitable to mine those minerals out of the ground. So after that, we need to you know, keep the economy afloat. So we stimulated the uh, the housing boom that we've just seen uh, by getting those white highlights instead of being in every mining town, we're seeing in every building area or a blue collar area where builders are actually, you know, becoming more profitable and all that sort of stuff. And that's been the boom that we've been through uh, last time. But this time, I think that we'll see a lot more, you know, where's the cement trucks going to go if there's no house construction happening and all that sort of stuff. And I think we're going to see, you know, infrastructure projects to be able to cover that. Uh, however, when you're not building something like so between the years in Sydney market, for example, of 2003 and 2009, we didn't see much uh, building happen in the Sydney market. Before GFC, it was really, really bad. And, you know, the stimulus package sort of pushed that along uh, because we had such a high pent up of demand and when the interest rates had actually dropped by probably about 60% of their worth within a period of five months, we saw you know, a lot of people wanting to buy housing and there wasn't enough, and that's obviously what pushed the prices up. And you know, if, if you want to ask me where I see interest rates going uh, after the crash, uh, I see interest rates going to negative interest rates. I don't have my charts with me tonight, I'm just talking about it off the cuff, but during the uh, during the GFC and where we're at at the moment, I wish I had actually put it in the slide, but go back to video number one, obviously. But um, I'll put them in in there where uh, if you look at places like Sweden, they're on negative interest rates. So it actually costs you to have your money in the bank. Um, that's not a sustainable model. And I think that we'll eventually end up seeing the, um, you know, the dollar die. And when I say that the dollar will die, as I said beforehand, there's been over uh, 10,000 fiat currencies over the last 1,000 years. Everyone's been programmed to only know the dollar uh, to, to what they use. Uh, there is countries out there, Venezuela, where hyperinflation has uh, you know, eradicated their uh, market, their financial markets, and there's no food, there's no ability to obtain food, no one wants to take their money, and they're literally raiding the zoos to eat the animals so they can survive. And looking at, um, looking at the interest rates at the moment, what, uh, as I said before, and I can see some messages coming through um, the about the interest rates globally uh, going up at the moment. I called in my VIP sort of Christmas party last year, uh, where I had you know a lot of my uh, being listed family clients, where um, where they come along to the annual Christmas party. I'd actually called that would see two interest rate uh, increases this year of 20, 25 basis points, so a quarter of a percent. If the economy was so strong, we would have seen those interest rates up much higher than where they are today. However, uh, just due to the fact that they can't go up because if you increase the interest rates, as I was saying beforehand, if interest rates were to go up, it wouldn't just affect uh, the property market, it would affect most uh, commercial sort of markets. So for example, if you're a business, and if we look at the stock markets out there, most businesses, if you look at I saw an article on Tesla the other day, they need $10 million a day to keep their doors open. A lot of companies out there are actually burning through um, so much money, it's like throwing money into an incinerator. If the uh, cost of money went up so greatly, uh, what we would see is a um, is those business would be in so, such great trouble. So that's why I believe that APRA has been installed Surprise, surprise, since 2016, September 2016, is where they made their first move into the market. To obviously control and regulate uh, you know, the monetary supply to ensure that we're all sort of protected. And I think that Australian banks are quite conservative and quite strong. And I think that the, the means of what has happened, even though I wish that APRA wasn't here, because we could be buying a lot more properties uh, on a regular basis. and you know, people will be able to build their portfolios a lot quicker and all that sort of stuff. Sorry, just leaving the drink of water. Um, what, what I think it has done is shielded us and given us a bit of a buffer there to be able to go back and add stimulus when uh, the GFC part two comes in. 
So I do see interest rates heading to zero in the not too distant future, but it will only occur once we have some sort of financial crisis out there. Um, go and research a little bit further into how the monetary system works and also look at the first video. Um, if we look at what happened post GFC, uh, we saw prices um, move very quickly. Uh, that was partly due to the fact that our monetary supply had been, uh, you know, made more affordable. You just half the cost of uh, money. So that's obviously going to push prices up. But another reason why is that there was many different stimulus packages that most of us didn't even see. We saw the borders open up so China could invest here or anywhere could invest into Australia. Um, and we saw a lot of smart money come in because people wanted to uh, put their money into Australian property because it's deemed as a, a safe asset and as a protected sort of asset class where, um, you know, a lot of money came in just to be safe. So uh, property in Australia, uh, when the share market's dropped by 40%, uh, when things are very uncertain, you've got a strong economy with a strong dollar and, you know, that's obviously why money f was flowing in. So, you know, I think that during this time that we see in the not too distant future at the moment we're just in a little bit of limbo land uh, where it's the sort of calm before the storm the windows are rattling in the market and all that sort of stuff but uh, once that comes we're going to be able to see you know new houses get built when after the the roofs get ripped off sort of thing so it will have a, a silver lining to it but it's yes, understanding the fundamentals of the property market in order to be able to capitalise upon that. Um, I think hyperinflation will be a definite. If we look at uh, before 2008, everyone says that there's been less than 3% CPI over the last decade uh, per year. If we look at some of the things and the costs that they've gone up by, I think it was um, in Perth, they're trying to, they're going to stop collecting recyclable goods, so your recycling bin is not going to be collected. And that's due to the fact that um, the company that contracts it is requiring more money because everything and the cost of goods are going up. And we're starting to see signs of a hyperinflation. I think that the stimulus that will come after this liquidity crisis, we're going to see uh, very, very strong inflation. Paddle pops go back in 2008 were like 80 cents. Paddle pops in 2018 are like $2.50. If you had a thousand bucks in 2008, you could buy 1,200 paddle pops. If you have a thousand dollars in 2018, you can only buy 400 paddle pops. If you go and buy a Big Mac in 2008, it probably tastes like shit and still look the same at the moment. <laughs> However, the Big Mac meal was like five, six bucks, and they're looking at 10, 11 bucks, and that's just for basic uh, food. And that's because the CPI index doesn't cover utilities or uh, food. So that's um, you know some things to watch out for. But I think the prices will rise on, on lots of different occasions. Uh, I think that opportunities will dry up because people will be trying to spend their, their money as there's more money out there in the marketplace. And there will be a lot of uncertainty. And if you can you know understand what the next move's gonna be and the next trigger that's gonna get pulled in the economic cycle, then you can you know be well placed with confidence to be able to take uh, the actions to, to, to purchase you know, to do those sorts of things. So with it, um, how to protect, you, protect yourself uh, during the crash. Uh, I think it's important to have a budget. A lot of people have been, you know, going through a good time, uh, but, you know, good times that we've seen aren't sustainable for all forever. So it's important as always. I have a budget and just my budget's mainly just for my basic amenities, how many haircuts a year do you get, how much do you spend on your food, so on and so forth, to understand where your cash flow is going. So if you do need help on setting a budget, I actually do have a, a Excel form. Now you can email the office at admin at beinvested.com.au and I can get uh, my team to send over the budget Excel file and you can enter in your details and sort of get your budget together. But in essence, a lot of people over the course of the last few years have actually, um, you know, not budgeted. They've used their house as an ATM. They've been, you know, buying a jet ski, buying cars, getting stuck in the consumeristic sort of rat race and a hamster wheel. And, you know, 
that may not be the case. You may not be able to go back to your house and pull out equity for the next thing that you need to go and buy or, you know, whatever the case may be. So having a budget, understanding where your household income's at and the, the cash flow expenses is quite good. Um, I'm, seeing, I'm seeing some questions, some comments coming in that uh, their partners don't understand the word budget. It's important that, you know, investing as a couple, if you're in a, a married or in a partner, a de facto relationship or whatever, to, to understand that, you know, your household should be treated as a business. Um, and I don't mean like by every sense, but your budgeting, your finances, um, you know, businesses that don't budget and plan, they don't generally last too long. Um, and that's what happens to a lot of, you know, family households if their finances get messed up. So it's important to to make sure, um, you know, that you do budget, make sure that you stay liquid. So a lot of people are living paycheck to paycheck and, you know, I think it's about 70 percent of the population looking at the stats last time uh, that actually do live paycheck to paycheck and you know having capital there in case something does go wrong in case interest rates do go up for a period of six months or 12 months i don't think interest rates physically how i see interest rates myself going up is interest rates are at 1.5 150 basis points if they were to go up and double just by 150 basis points, most people would be in trouble. I'm not just talking in from a household perspective, I'm talking about business, economics, and everything like that uh, in between. And it, it's very important to understand those those metrics of it. So having liquidity in your own budget is, is important, not just from that perspective, but also for an opportunity perspective, because opportunities are rising ahead in the market at the moment. I'm, Getting you know excited and surprised, um, you know, by the actual amount of opportunities that are you know sort of popping their heads up in the market. I think uh, it's important to make educated decisions. Uh, a lot of people get emotional. They'll go, oh, you know, this sounds all bad. I'm going to go sell all my properties, or I'm going to you know keep all my money in the bank account. If and this is what I think is really important to watch video number one because I talk about um, you know what printing more money does. And if we look at, you know, the uh, it's reported that back in the Reimar government, back in the 1920s in, in Germany, um, that you could retire on 50,000 marks, uh, which would be like, say, having $5 million in the bank account at the moment. However, uh, after the uh, big recession over in Germany in the 20s, uh, the banks closed your bank account and didn't even send you a letter because a postage stamp was worth more than 50,000 marks. So, you know, just imagine having $5 million and then 10 years later, five years later, you can't even buy a postage stamp because uh, the dollar's been hyperinflated. Um, I don't think that the severity would be that strong, but you know, it's a fair, far-fetched sort of uh, outcome. But I think that we're headed in that direction on the monetary policy side of things. So the way I view money is that I don't, I look at the opportunity of what money can do, but I hate money. I think that, you know, cash is sort of trash out there. Um, it gives you an opportunity to do something. If you can leverage into something else, it's going to make you more money. Uh, debt becomes irrelevant with inflation. So I might just let that sit in for a moment. Debt becomes irrelevant with inflation. So if we're seeing larger amount of inflation, it means it's easy to pay that debt off. So that's why I see uh, property is a very fungible sort of um, dynamic sort of uh, financial instrument because it has the opportunity for growth from a capital perspective and from a cash flow perspective. Uh, a lot of people say, oh, you know, your property's gone up a lot in value and stuff like that. If you really consider it, the money has gone down half right the cost of money has gone down half in the period of 10 years but the property has doubled right so the question i ask is it my property that's gone up in value or is it the dollar that's gone down in value because if you go back to 1999 and speak to someone before the boom that before we just seen and told them that a house in sydney would be worth a million bucks it'd be like hey, the house is two hundred thousand dollars i can't physically see how that could happen. And it's all just to how the monetary supply is going out in the marketplace. So, you know, understanding those fundamentals, um, get the right advice, 
Uh, be very careful, as I said, where you get your advice from. Most mortgage brokers out there uh, want to sell you a property or make sure that you buy a property that's got a higher value. I quite often hear, uh, obviously, because some of the properties that I buy, uh, for well, most of the properties I buy for clients are like that 300 grand, 200 grand, 300 grand price range. And brokers, you know, I've got a, I've got a lot of companies as part of the Be Invested group, uh, for those that don't know. But one of my uh, businesses is a uh, finance company and uh, my finance strategist, you know, I always laugh to people because I look at it more as a charity than a business because you know, mortgage broker and business, uh, people will go and write a loan for half a million dollars or a million dollars and they set it away and, uh, you know, they get paid the commission. However, you know, my finance guys have to go in there and do a loan for a 200 grand property. So if you want to get paid the same amount as a 600 grand property, you've got to do three loans separately. So it's three times the amount of work. And in the middle of that, um, the, there's going to be refinances, equity, pull down and stuff like that. Most mortgage brokers say, buy the bigger house. It'll be better. Negative gear, it'll be better. But, you know, they're just trying to sell you the finance to fit that sort of product. And you know, at the end of the day, is that in the best interest to be able to get to the end goal of financial independence or whatever you're trying to create a level of financial freedom for? Um, I see a lot of real estate agents try and give advice as well on that same token. A lot of real estate agents, oh, sell the property, buy the property. You know, they're just trying to get a commission from a transaction, but you need to look at the fundamentals. Uh, a lot of people say to me, you know, uh, that, yeah, like a real estate agent just called me up and told me I should sell my property. I'm like, if you sell that property, you know, what's it going to do for you? How's it going to help you get to where you need to be? What about if you look at this angle, this angle, this angle? And, you know, the advice that you get out there is, is very important. Um, yeah, be very, very careful where you get that from. Uh, always look at your worst case scenarios. Uh, a lot of people look at, you know, rose colored glasses. It's important to look at your best case, your worst case, an actual case, and try and you know understand that you know you may be looking here right at the moment, but there's other areas we need to look at as well. Uh, very important. I don't know how many of you here today have actually got properties at the moment. If you're thinking of getting into property, or if you have got one or two properties, or if you've got a larger property portfolio. Uh, as I said at the start, I'd like to put little disclaimers around when I'm going to talk about something that could be controversial or go to someone else's jurisdiction. I'm not a financial advisor, I'm not a mortgage broker or anything like that. I'm just a dude that invests into property and other sort of financial instruments with my own knowledge. Uh, however, what I think is very important at the moment is people <clears throat> get lazy uh, on pulling out equity or accessing the equity. Uh, at this point in time, you know, a lot of people just go, oh, I've got equity in the property, I might go get it out. But if the bank's lending gets tighter, it might be hard to get your equity out. If the valuations don't stack up down the track, you won't be getting your equity out. So, you know, are we going to see the market double in the next six months? I doubt it. Are we going to see it go up in the next six months? It depends. Are we going to see it go flat? Most likely, are we going to see it go backwards with potential? So, you know, for me personally, I went out and tried to get as much equity that I could out of my properties to ensure that, you know, you've got it as a, a treasure test to the side. And I'm seeing a lot of people, you know, taking that action to protect themselves. Um, doesn't mean you have to go and spend that money. It could just be kept in an offset account. But while the opportunities are out there, lending is getting tougher by the week. Uh, I do have an episode on this webinar series about financing and what I'm actually experiencing out there in the market at the moment. Um, as always, don't get emotion, emotional. Uh, most people, where they stuff up, I've been interviewed for the last you know ten years on certain aspects of investing and where you know people get stuck in that. And uh, the biggest thing that I've seen over the years is most people get a lot of people get emotionally attached, whether it be I've got to have this or I don't want to buy that because it's not good enough for me or whatever the case may be. They might be like I'm scared. Uh, or my friend told me this, or my friend told me that, or my family told me this. Uh, don't get emotional. Uh, make educated decisions and make sure that you're doing the right decisions and you've got all bases covered and that your house of cards is solid. Make sure your cash flow is intact, make sure your liquidity is intact, um, and make sure that you know you, you've got yourself in a solid position, not just to 
get through and weather any sort of you know flat period or you know rocky period through a market but to ensure that you know you you've got the opportunity to really kick ass uh when the time is needed and when you want to be able to you know i'll see people out there and say oh, i wish i could have bought properties back then i wish i could have bought this i wish i should have done that but the opportunities may show themselves we you know you could get something 10 percent cheaper 15 percent cheaper 20 percent cheaper in a bank repo deal a bulk deal whatever um but without you know having your house of cards in order and having access to the funds you, you might be missing out on the opportunities when they arrive um the other thing as well is uh, i don't advise people to sell properties because what i I've never really heard many people that have come to me and said, I'm so glad I sold my house in Sydney back in 2005, right? You just don't hear it because it's the way that the monetary system is is placed and positioned means that we've got a deflationary currency that we're using. So that means that everything else inflates because the dollar's buying less. It's, you know, it's on a trajectory. I uh, wish I had put my chance in here. I feel really bad for not having it today. Um, but uh, people don't sit there and, you know, celebrate for the fact that they sold the property for much cheaper going back a decade ago. Um, so I don't normally tell people to sell or whatnot. However, if you um, if you are trying to get out of something, if you do need to make a decision, you've got something that's draining, draining your cash flow. For me personally, I went through a phase going back. I got caught with the uh, APRA changes back in 2016. I was trying to settle $10 million property and, you know, I don't want to sell properties. I don't need to sell. I don't, it's not what I do. I just want to keep collecting and accumulating them. But I was in a position where I had to make decisions. I was like, I'm going to sell these properties because it's going to make me in a better position. And, you know, I was able to, you know, just like the Monopoly board, swap the houses for the motels and, and so on and so forth to be able to put yourself in a stronger position. So if you do sort of need to sell, uh, the opportunity is still out there to sell. But if things are getting tighter from a sales perspective, it may, you know, it may not be in the best interest to sell. It might be a better decision to sell now than in six months, so on and so forth, if you have to sell. For me personally, I just want to take my whole portfolio into the next cycle because I know that as they print more money, the dollar will die, it will buy less, and assets will rise uh, in, you know, inevitably from that. Um, what does it mean for property out there? By this point in time, you might be uh, sitting there thinking to yourself, oh, shit, should I buy property? Should I sell property? What should I do? Whatever. Um, I think in the short term, uh, there's buying opportunities. I'm definitely seeing the buying opportunities out there. Uh, when will they change this? I think it will be, when will this change? Sorry. Uh, I think it will change inevitably once uh, we have more liquidity in the marketplace. And whenever that is, it could be, a matter of a decision, it could be a week, a month, a year, two years, but I, I highly doubt it. I think that before the end of 2018 is out, I think we're gonna see uh, some very choppy waters in the financial markets. And, um, you know, sometimes when people see me, they go, oh, it looks like it's tight or whatever. I generally stay awake for 20 hours of the day. I read two markets. Uh, I stay awake until early hours of the morning, six o'clock, seven o'clock some days, and go to sleep at that point. Um, and I need to know what's happening in every sort of market because I'm seeing the exciting things that happen out there. And I can tell you from reading financial markets um, that, yeah, I don't think that we're going to see out of 2018 without some, um, you know, financial event, which is going to end up meaning stimulus is going to come into the, into the market. For property, uh, that means the opportunities that are going to pop up, uh, prices may be a bit cheaper. Um, it might be a bit harder to sell. Um, as I said beforehand, a bit harder to obtain finance. I've just got a few notes here. Um, difficult, difficulty to uh, get access to equity uh, or funds from the banks. Um, I've seen a lot of people, like it was about eight months ago, I was talking to my finance guys in the office and we are talking about the banks, and it was one of the big four, had just changed their back-end policies, which meant that someone that could service with $2,000 per month or $3,000 per month uh, serviceability by the new policy that was enacted, you know, that day meant that they could only, that they were negative on their servicing calculator by 
you know, a thousand dollars or something like that. And it's just the back end policies of the banks are tightening up, they're being regulated and they don't want to put themselves at as much risk, um, you know, by lending so much out there. So it's important to make sure across that. Um, I think rents may rise. Uh, we're starting to see, I'm hearing trouble out there in some of the, the building uh, spaces. So um, a lot a lot of people that have bought their land, for example, the, um, <clears throat> the like just in building companies in general, I've heard like three or four of them which are in financial difficulty because there's first home buyers that may have gone out there, bought themselves a block of land, went to build their house, but they can't actually obtain the finance to um, to, to to build the, the house on it. And one of the things that you know I've always said to these developers when I do those big large bulk deals <clears throat> is that there's a difference between getting a deal across the line or um, you know being able to complete it and close it and before you know any of our people here uh, purchase the properties and get themselves stuck. We need, we need to make sure before they buy the deal that their finance position, you know, could weather some of those changes out there. So it's important to forecast that um, in the marketplace. Longer term, what do I see happening? Uh, I see the dollar dying, uh, prices being inflated, and I see that property prices will go up. If you notice, and go and have a look back through charts of history in uh, Australian property prices and so on and so forth, there's sp specific parameters that get manipulated before we see a property boom, right? And there's specific parameters which get closed up before a property market goes flat. Uh, it just depends on what those parameters are. So if we take um, the Sydney property market uh, and look at that. In 2000, we saw the prices go up with the introduction of the first homeowner grant. We saw that sort of taper down as interest rates sort of went up, and we see that interest rates went down very significantly to all time lows uh, throughout the GFC. We saw the house prices go up. The only difference with this cycle, and that's why I'm talking about the death of the dollar, is that the interest rates have not been able to recover and get back to uh, any sort of normal sort of length. So, just things to look out for. Um, I think that we will see um, another boom as a squeeze on the market. Uh, I think we'll see less stock in the market and rental increases uh, over the period of you know what comes after this. Because if we look um, in the Sydney market around 2007, 2008, 2009, um, we actually saw rents double almost in a lot of scenarios. So I remember my first property was out in Mount Druid. Uh, when I bought it, uh, I couldn't rent it out. It was vacant for, I rented it out and I needed to put another tenant in there. And at the time, I had to give like two weeks rent free. I actually put it on for, for lease with, um, I think it was trading post, I put it in the trading post or something. And I found a tenant myself because the real estate agents couldn't find me tenants. And it was vacant for a few months at that period of time. And, you know, I saw, you know, a lot of the, the rental market very tough in the early 2000s. So like 2002, 2003, my first job, funny story, I, I thought that um, I wanted to be a real estate agent and a lot of people think I was a real estate agent in my career. I worked in the corporate world. However, I did work in real estate for a short period of time. And my first job, I put a suit on and went out to the area where I wanted to buy property. and asked for a job in real estate and my first job was putting up signs out the front of the properties and showing the rental properties and stuff like that and I remember back in 2002 that you know you'd have, you'd see a property sit there for three months vacant uh, without rent coming in and so on and so forth and during um, the periods between 2003 and 2009 there wasn't any sort of construction happening there wasn't construction happening there was no cr cranes in the sky due to the GFC and liquidity being sucked out of the market at that period of time. And, you know, because of that, there was a lot of, there was a lot of migration happening in the market and, um, you know, prices, the rental prices went up through the roof and, you know, if rents go up, uh, if you've got 10 properties and the rents rise by $100 per week, there's a thousand bucks per week or 50 grand a year coming through. So, um, you know, it's important to understand when will the rental increases come? Uh, how will the rental increases come? What can you do to help out the rental increases come and so on and so forth? 
Um, the next boom I think we'll see in capital cities again. However, given um, you know the fundamentals and I'm reverting back to once again the first video, I was talking about uh, you know commodities. When uh, there's a financial crisis, uh, what we find is that commodities and resources uh, spike in value. It doesn't matter if it's corn, oil, wheat. Um, or gold or silver, uh, they will increase in value. And if we see a financial crisis come in, there is a potential, and I, I'm not advocating, I don't buy in uh, mining towns, I see them as a high risk. I've bought a couple over the years, like, I mean like five out of 10,000 properties in these places just because I saw good opportunities at those specific moments to get something. But, um, there could be a, a commodities boom, and if there was a commodities boom, there could be sort of a mining boom surrounding that. So uh, something to look out for. It's something that I wouldn't like to speculate on that at this point. Uh, I'd like to be making a call like that when things fluctuate in price. I need to see what the commodity prices go up to to work out backwards and reverse engineer whether it's going to be profitable for the companies to go and pull the materials out of the ground and whether you'd be able to see. Um, you know, the, 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 the need and the demand there for it to happen. I think um, what it means for property as well on a final note on this one is that we will see um, finance will become easier. So once we see a potential uh, GFC sort of scenario, we could see more Chinese investors come into the country as they open up those uh, abilities for them to buy properties. Uh, we would could possibly see uh, lending get relaxed to help, st help stimulate the economy, and that is a point when the property prices would take off. And if they take off, you don't want to be you know trying to buy properties at that point in time because you know if I look at my own portfolio, if I didn't do do everything I had to do all the hustle and the hard work to get to like 25 properties at the age of 24, 25, um, I wouldn't have had those properties which would have doubled overnight. Um, in a period of 12 months, 24 months, I would have been having to accumulate and collect those properties at that period of time. But because I already had my portfolio, I got them when it was you know, a tougher day. Those properties went up, I could pull that equity out and you know, really capitalise um, you know, the power of compounding at that point. So just a few things to, to keep an eye out for. Um, will prices go up or down in a, in a financial crash? Uh, a lot of financial commentators will sit out there and tell you, oh, they'll crash, they're going to crash by this amount. Please go through history and tell me whether capital cities uh, have gone down in value. Uh, uh, you know, there has been times where things have become more affordable in certain segments of markets where, you know, things may have gone back by 10%, but in some certain isolated markets in there, you could have got a couple of bank repos people aren't looking at and you could have got a 20, 30% below market value. However, um, you know, I personally don't feel that we're going to see the house prices halve or anything like that. I see that we're in a flat market. We're going to see desperate people, people that are really motivated to sell. The opportunity is to go in there with a baseball bat and stack them around a little bit, give them a sign of contract and pick up the properties cheaper. The reason why I said to protect yourself going into this and have the knowledge behind you is because you don't want to be one of those people that gets hit with a baseball bat with someone trying to get the property off you cheaper. Uh, however, if we look at uh, the Australian property market, the market is very counter-cyclical. Everyone's just fixated on saying Sydney house prices have gone up so high, et cetera, et cetera. I will actually touch on something, it's a bit of a random topic, that uh, if we look at the front page of all the newspapers going back 18 months ago, because I know I was, being interviewed about it, but they don't want to hear about it in the mainstream because people go, oh, that's not the case or whatever the, the thing might be. But um, at that period of time, 18 months ago, uh, they were saying, oh, house prices are unaffordable in Sydney. House prices are unaffordable in Melbourne. Most people just looked at the house prices and said that was the issue. However, if we look at a bigger picture, because I was looking at the news at that period of time uh, in, in these scenarios, and the front pages of newspapers in Canada, UK, US, um, the Philippines said that house prices are unaffordable. And it's not because there's a big rush for everyone to go to the Philippines. The house prices went up so great. It's because the monetary policy had changed. And that's what made those prices go up. 
And what we've got to look at is over the period of the last decade, right, a lot of people are saying Sydney's gone up, Melbourne's gone up, all the house prices have gone up, it's too hard to get into a market. What people haven't realised is that between 2003 and 2009, the Sydney market was shit. No one was buying property. Everyone was saying it was really bad. Sorry for the swearing. Um, I'd say it as it is. That's why it's called raw and uncut. But Sydney house price between 2003 and 2009 hit a point and then they went backwards a little bit. It wasn't too bad. Um, for example, a house, red brick house in the Hills District of Sydney um, it was like 500. It probably went to 450 and sit on there for a while. Someone might take 430. It was that sort of market. Some may have lost 70 grand from the absolute peak. There was other areas like Western Sydney where people paid 300 and they weren't in a position to buy. Lending practices weren't as tight as what they are today, etc. And there was a lot of white pieces of paper on the front windows of houses, which meant that they were bank repoed. And you could pick up, you know, a 300 grand property for 200 grand at the time. And it was like, who wants to buy that? Live there, it's shit, whatever. Uh, I remember when I first started you know, being invested, people were like, why would you buy a property there? And it's like, well, you need to look at the fundamentals, you need to look at the infrastructure, you need to look at all the things that are surrounding it to be able to make a decision on where will it be in the future with all the potentials that are out there. And uh, if we look at that period of the market between 2003 and 2009, that was the Sydney market, it was shit. But then if we go and fly up north to Queensland, you would have seen between about 04, uh, I remember it was like 19, I was you know, dating this girl on a holiday and I'd heard about this area and it was like in, uh, in Brisbane and it was like the Mount Druid of Brisbane sort of thing. And house price, you, townhouses were like $60,000 and like walls meant to be going to the, you know, the theme parks. I was trying to go to these shitty areas to research property. And it was pre the internet. You didn't have realestate.com and all those sorts of things as they are today uh, to actually go and research. I had to go and pound the pavement, you know, wear the soles off my thongs. I wasn't wearing thongs at times, wearing shoes. You know what I mean? Like speaking to the agents and getting an understanding of the markets at that period of time. And the market there, I saw some markets, they tripled in price between 04 and about 2010, 2011. Uh, what happened in that period of time is that when the GFC hit that, so in Sydney, we had a flat property market and then we had the GFC, so there was no construction and Sydney is a doormat to the country. It would be political suicide for any government to slow down or to remove migration into the country. We need to bring people in so they can work, so they can pay tax, so our government system can work and our government debt is lowered because we've got more income coming in from people paying taxes. So the Sydney market had a lot of people coming in, not enough building, and that's why we've seen the boom. Couple that with cheap money and a construction boom and everyone getting the hype has pushed those prices up. If you look at the Queensland market, the Queensland market between 04 and 2010 had its boom because it was good value. However, uh, coming out of the GFC, there's a lot of projects that were like it was halfway through a boom and a GFC had, had, had hit. Um, and a lot of developers got themselves into trouble. A lot of people had overstretched themselves and all those sorts of things. And the market got affected and the prices went back. So as Sydney prices were going up, Queensland prices were coming down. So they're not at the same rate. Not everything's gone up in value. Uh, since the last you know, five years, six years, specifically in Sydney and prices, everyone's got onto the fact that prices are increasing. The Queensland prices sort of went down a little bit and then came back up, but they never went at the full swing. So that's why I say you know, the Queensland prices, there's certain specific markets in Queensland where, you know, they are very, very prime but the, the, for a boom, but the market isn't allowing it from a finance side of things. So if we look at a lot of regional areas, uh, going back throughout the years of 2003 and 2008, was there a mining boom happened where Karatha, shitbox towns in the middle of Whoop Whoop, which were selling for $50,000, a house has suddenly become a million dollars. They're renting for $3,000 per week because there's no houses there. A mining company's come in, they've got to put in all the civil works, they've got to lay all the, the pipes for all the coal seam gas or whatever to come through. and yeah, that created a great opportunity for those sort of booms. But what I did realise before 
all the hype of that way back in the day when I had a face full of pimples and a face full of grey hair is that yeah, that is unsustainable. And we saw that boom and then we saw it crash. It may resuscitate. I don't know what's going to happen, but that was at a different time frame. We've seen literally the Perth prices go down as Sydney prices have gone up. So where will you be finding those opportunities? And that is, is the question, you know, uh, it's a million dollar question. And that's why it's important to have your finger on the pulse when it comes to property markets to be able to, you know, understand where you can run from safety and go and absolutely, you know, decimate with opportunity in, in those sort of markets. So uh, one thing, you know, I've said a lot of negative stuff with financial markets because I think the financial market is a time bomb. Um, the one thing that I do say, which is on a really positive note, is just remember that we're a very young country. We're, you know, just over 200 years old, 220 years old, I think this year actually. Um, and we're a very aspirational country in the world where people want to live. And we need to be able to provide housing for them to come here. And we don't have enough housing. I remember back in 2011, we were like 180,000 dwelling short in this country for where we need to be. And uh, as of now, I think we're, uh, even after all this construction that's happened, we're about 330,000 dwelling short. So getting in the mid 2020s, uh, we're gonna see um, where it's predicted to go, pulling out statistical data, is that we're on track to be 650,000 dwelling short uh, for Australia. So you know, there is a pent up of demand there. So don't get scared that, you know, and that's why I guess, uh, you know, Australian property market is a strong and a safe sort of investment because the, the, the fundamentals are correct for it to be. Um, how can you, sorry that it's taken a bit long, this one's gone on over the hour. Uh, I will finish up very shortly. This is the last thing I want to talk about. Uh, how to capitalise on opportunities uh, at hand. Make sure you have a plan. Uh, make sure you have, I treat my investing like a business, I always have. And I think it's important to sort of, um, you know, treat it like you had a business plan. How would your property portfolio look? Here you are today, here you are in the future. What, do the, what does the middle bit look like? What action steps do you need to take? Um, what are the parameters that you don't want to go towards? What are the things that you really need to hone in on? <clears throat> Get a team of experts on board. Um, a lot of people fail because they have shit advice, shit people that can't help them, uh, you know, throughout their journey. Um, so, you know, having the right team, I, I always said that people say, you know, be invested is really cool. You've got a cool business. I love everyone. They're all happy and, you know, they're very informative and stuff like that. And, you know, you, you're doing well. You're so great. Your business is great, whatever. But I'm only as strong as the people that I've got around me, right? And it doesn't matter in what capacity, right? Let's say you're a, you're a pro golfer. If you've got a shit team or a pro race car driver, I had some of my mates, they like, I hate sport, but um, they were watching F1 the other day from somewhere. And I went and watched it in the cinema with them. And the I saw where they drive the cars in the pit stop and they have a team and you know, just one second, two seconds, it's a, a delay could cost them the position of winning that race. And you know, having a good team is imperative. I understand the markets and what's driving it. Uh, it's not necessarily a house that you can subdivide. It. It's not necessarily a house in your street or the emotion. That's just emotion, right? It's understanding, um, you know, the fundamentals of what drives any financial markets. Property, I look at it as a financial instrument. That's why, you know, I've looked at it in a very different light to most people. Uh, that's why I guess I've been successful. I don't like talking about it in an exciting way, but this. You know, it's how I use and see property uh, being able to use it as a vehicle. Uh, look out for bargains out there in the marketplace. Bargains are out there. I think we will see bargains for you know, a period of time, but I don't think it's going to be a long drawn out period where we're going to see lots of bargains forever because once we see you know, a liquidity crash in financial markets, we're going to see lots of stimulus and it's going to have a flow on effect and property is going to be a very big beneficiary of the stimulus that's going to come to protect ourselves from the GFD. Uh, make sure you have your finance ready. Um, got some little notes here. You make sure your finance is ready. Make sure you speak to you know, whoever your finance strategist is to make sure that you know, you know, should I be working on paying down some credit cards? Should I be working on 
you know, saving up? Should I be working on getting a property ready to pull out equity? Should I be selling a property? Who knows? Um, make sure that you're not running, you know, loads of stupid debt. A car loan impacts it. I've seen people with like five grand, 10 grand, 20 grand credit cards. Once they remove them, they've been able to service. So, you know, it is important to, you know, have a knowledge of what's happening out there with the finance market. Uh, to ensure that you know you're going to be ready to take a position, you might be saving up for a deposit, but one little silly mistake that you do today could hurt you. It could be, I don't know, getting that two grand credit card to buy that new iPhone or new Mac or whatever. Um, so, so be careful not to make stupid decisions. Uh, understand what opportunities look like. Uh, do your research in the areas of the markets. Be sniffing around for the bargains. Know what bargains look like and pounce upon them. Um, don't get emotional and know your markets very well. So on that note, I've got one last thing to talk about. A lot of people have been asking me uh, over the last five, six, seven years uh, to uh, do mentoring. Uh, I've, I'm a person that doesn't, I don't sell my time. I, I do my business for fun. Uh, you know, that's why I wear a pair of thongs every day and have a laugh and just say it as it is because I really don't need to do this. Uh, I could be happy, you know, doing whatever I want in my days. But, you know, when I retired at 25, I had a pretty boring life. I don't like traveling, I don't go overseas. I like to, you know, I wanted people to enjoy, to enjoy, you know, the journey with. And what I realized is that property investing can be a lonely journey, it can be boring, it can be, um, you know, you may not have people that you can talk to, so that's, in essence, why I started being invested. And you know, I once had a group of 20 people uh, when I first started the business, and I said for one year, uh, I would do a mentoring program with those people. And I did that mentoring program, and out of the 20 people, there was at least a dozen uh, people that were millionaires within the first year from investing in the property. It was a one-on-one -on -one mentoring, and I said I would never do that again. Um, I've had people over the years want to try and you know buy an hour of my time for five thousand dollars, and I don't want to sell my time. I just, you know, try and give as much free content as I can uh, on a regular basis out there, and you know, help people be able to, you know, get ahead. So, uh, from that perspective, I've been asked a lot for it. I've committed myself for the next twelve months to do a fortnightly webinar with the community. Uh, it's a raw, raw and uncut uh, mentoring program. In essence, what I'm going to be sharing is 15 years of my active investing uh, knowledge out there to be able to deliver you know, things that I've learned along the way, be able to give you tips and knowledge from every aspect, whether it be from locating properties, negotiating properties, renovating properties. A lot of people don't remember, but back in the old days, uh, I used to wear a suit when I was uh, employed in the corporate world. After that's when I started being the bogan, wearing shirts and stuff like that. I was a hardcore reno guy. Uh, I'd renovate like a house with a paint carpet, kitchen, bathroom. There might be some of those old videos on YouTube now um, where I'd renovate a kitchen, bathroom, paint carpet, blinds for like six and a half, seven thousand uh, dollars $7,000. I'll be showing everything that I've learned over the years, uh, over the course of the next uh, 12 months uh, on a regular basis, as I said, every fortnight. As well as that, I'll be doing three, three two-day live events where I'll be covering every aspect uh, of property and investing. Uh, I'll also be bringing in from time to time some experts, be it financial advisors, uh, whether it be my accountants, whether it be my lawyers, whether it be my builders, whether it be my property management staff, to be able to look at you know, specific sort of topics. and. You know, one could imagine that there'd be a lot of money. Uh, if someone wanted to turn up to my two-day weekend event, it will be $2,000 for the two-day event. However, uh, the mentoring program uh, that I will be launching, uh, you'll get an email very shortly uh, regarding the mentoring program. Uh, it'll be $3,000 for the 12 months. Uh, that's all. Uh, if you look at how much it costs you for a personal trainer, I pay 85 bucks a week for a personal trainer and I'm a bit of a fat bastard. Um, <laughs> I need to go to the gym some more. Uh, with it, uh, this is 60 bucks per week uh, for you to be able to get knowledge uh, from someone that's got hundreds of properties, has seen lots of things over the last you know, one and a half decades. Uh, I'll be sharing every aspect from negotiating, locating, uh, financing, planning, mindset, 
anything that will be community driven. So I'm going to be expecting that uh, the community asks me the topics of what they'd like me to cover and I'll be creating the modules around that to be able to you know, get as close and as intimate as I can uh, over the course of the next 12 months. So as I said, uh, the price is $3,000. Uh, for the mentoring program. It will be going to $6,000, $8,000 within a not too distant future, next couple of weeks. And once we've got enough people in the mentoring program, I will be cancelling the applications for people to come into it and we will not be accepting any new uh, enrolments into the mentoring program moving forward. So uh, if you are interested, check out the email. Uh, appreciate your time tonight and thanks a lot for having me as a part of your viewing. Uh, I might. Have a look here. Um, got some, I've got a lot of questions here. Uh, I can see that I've been here for one and a half hours tonight, guys. What I might do is I'll take questions and I'll make uh, YouTube videos and I'll get them out over the course of the next couple of weeks to ensure that I answer all your questions for you. We'll catch up soon and have an awesome evening. And yeah, have an awesome one.